What is this Mr. Sales enablement? 100,000 euros. Uh, in that first year, I probably met 100, 150 different companies. The reality is a bit reverse. When you're in the startup scene, you feel like the market moves so mm -hmm. fast. There's new stuff coming every few months and wow. It is a huge industry. Our first client was Wärtsilä. Want to be, you know, get the investment or not. So if you have Wärtsilä there, it helps. Yeah. This is also the key for most of the businesses. Anything under a million, focus on sales and that's it. Welcome back to the Get Cracking channel. I hope you're already watching us on YouTube. We are also available on all the, all the platforms, but YouTube is the thing that everybody must be. And today, another podcast interview and a discussion with uh, Mr. Sales Enablement of Finland. Lauri, welcome. Thank you. Nice to be here. Uh, super good that you've been able to make it here. So if you don't know who is Lauri, uh, please go to his LinkedIn. Uh, Lauri Ruhala. Correct. Uh, check him out. He is actually super active in LinkedIn and he is posting and updating us about the sales process and how to sell and then how to be better in sales and also about his software and the platform and probably about, a bit about his journey as an entrepreneur. Sometimes, sometimes, but mainly it's about, uh, mainly my posts tend to be about the nitty gritty stuff salespeople face on a day to day level. So it feels like that's, that gets an audience. So go check it out and then tune back in to check this episode. Watch the episode first, <laughs> then check it out. <laughs> uh, yeah, so maybe let's get into it. Uh, Lauri, what would be like, um, could you introduce just yourself? So who are you, what do you do and what's your company doing? Uh, well, I'm Lauri uh, and I run a company called Sales Friend. Uh, we're a, well, we've already been doing sales enablement software for the last 12 years. Uh, and I've been the CEO of it for eight. Um, but I've been a salesperson in B2B sauce for close to 16 years now. And even though I'm the CEO, I still basically am a salesperson most of the time. But what we do is, uh, if you've ever been in sales, you've probably had to deal with the fact that um, you've tried to find sales materials uh, for a meeting that you're about to have, or you need to send an offer or send some materials to somebody. And that's a common issue that people face, that they can't find relevant materials because there's too many options actually in most organizations. There might be a hundred files that answer the same question, but you don't know which one's relevant. Um, so our platform is built so that users, salespeople could find the right content, use it in the right moment, which could be a sales meeting. It could be sending something, et cetera, and then get information about how that performed. So what did you present? How well did you present? What did you send? Did the customer actually engage with that? So it's a benefit for the salesperson from that perspective. But for the organization, it's about unifying sales message. Because if you don't have this in order, uh, organizations tend to realize that each sales rep has their own version of the pitch. And imagine how that multiplies if you have multiple products or thousands of products. So a lot of organizations would prefer that there would be a unified way of pitching, a unified message. And that can be really aided by having unified material. So unified material in our platform for sales reps to access quickly and then pitch. Yes, and it is a software as a service absolutely okay. yeah, yeah. It's a so SaaS platform SaaS platform and uh, could you share how big is the company like how many clients you have how many employees you have so we're a 10 person company uh we're a bootstrapped uh SaaS company so we haven't uh even looked for external funding um right now we're at about seven hundred thousand arr uh so seven hundred thousand euros uh annual recurring revenue but uh, client amount, a uh, bit more logos than actual clients, but logos around 80. So mm. some of those logos are under the same corporation, yeah. obviously, but mainly in the Nordics. Uh, so Finland is about 50% of our business and the other Nordic countries are most of the rest, mm. some exceptions in other countries as well. And it's interesting. So you mentioned actually two key topics that I had in mind that I wanted to ask you within this podcast. Mm -hmm. All other topics we also can dive in. This is like no problem. And also we maybe get you back later on to discuss others. But then these two were, uh, how did you actually became a CEO? Mm -hmm. Because it is interesting. Like, you know, we always hear the stories of, um, you know, okay, SaaS company, I had the pain, I've started the company, then I kind of bootstrapped the right yeah. fans. Here I am, right? So here my story, founder story, right? But then you actually... You're a CEO, right? So then how you got there? And then you mentioned yourself, you're bootstrapped. Mm -hmm. This is, um, you know, interesting for me because bootstrapping is is closer to my heart. Mm -hmm. Like I believe of doing like business first and then maybe scaling. So then it's not necessary that you need the funding. So let's dive in. <laughs> sure. 
so how is it um how was it do you remember how how was your journey mm -hmm. uh who was the lauri before he became a ceo and uh what thing enabled you becoming a CEO? Well, I mean, it would be great to tell you some amazing story, but uh, actual fact, um, personality-wise, like as a younger person, uh, as a kid, so to speak, I've always been organizing stuff. I've always been on like student councils. I've been a tutor in in the university, um, organizing all kinds of events and stuff. So I've always kind of had the role of organization, <laughs> even in the friend group, so to speak. Um, and then even with my first job, um, which wasn't in a corporation, um, this is a long story. Um, we were supposed to sell, uh, my first job was to sell Eastern European developers to finish software companies, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, near shoring was the term in 2007 and eight and nine. And, um, I found that difficult. I found it difficult to basically sell time uh, of developers uh, to companies who knew exactly what they wanted so it was just a question of price but what i realized very quickly was that it was actually easier to sell software projects to non-software companies so hey we've got all these cheap developers relatively cheap developers we could develop software for you customized so software for you cheaper than a finnish company could and that was interesting because you got to build custom stuff you got to you know there's a problem let's solve it with a piece of software and that, that, that became quite fun. So I wasn't just a salesperson. I was kind of consulting, uh, figuring out the needs right. and the requirements and so on. And that got me a job, uh, my next few jobs, uh, selling um, new products for established software companies, uh, which then in, at the end of the day landed me uh, a job at what was then called Sales Interactive, which became Sales Frame. Okay. Um, a lot of twists and turns on how that happened. But basically, I got a phone call from um, our original founder uh who had heard about me somehow so why would he call you his sister had recruited me to one of those jobs because she was a recruiter okay so her his sister had uh followed me on uh, linkedin and then she was just saying her she just to the brother like hey, there's one sauce guy yeah, yeah. there's one yeah. you know product yeah, check him product out yeah. sauce guy uh but still in sales and uh, they needed a sales guy for sales frame or sales interactive so i joined up um and the state we were in at that point, we were very much bespoke software, customized software. So we had uh, the, the company had been founded, um, several major logos as clients and also nice income already at that point. Um, but everything we'd built for them had been done, you know, case by case. Mm. There was no product, not really underneath a little bit. Um, and then again, I found this a bit difficult or in a way because you had to sell, you know, customized things. I had the experience of that, but now I also had the experience of selling products in the newer job. So I wanted to find ways to turn this into a more scalable, more replicable process. And um, that turned out also to be the right way to actually try and scale this mm. because, you know, we were a four, three, four, three or four person team. Uh, it's really hard to have several projects where you build customized stuff at the of same course time. if it's customized then it's kind of tailored long made for every time, every right? customer new project every time long delivery times yeah absolutely yeah, and imagine one bug and then you're back fixing something while you're supposed to be building something yeah, you're building else. new but then also you're fixing something from the previous case yeah exactly um so when we kind of made the decision that we should um we should start building a sauce platform out of this uh, that was the moment that I kind of pitched myself to the original founder that I should also be the CEO at that point. Um, and then I was, I became CEO. Uh, it took us about a year to get the platform up and running. How was that? How was this kind of process? So how was that process? And like, yeah, how did you, you just, it sounds so easy that you're like, okay, there's a company that we are doing this, this mm -hmm. kind of thing. And I pitched myself to be a CEO. And then after that, I'm a CEO. So like if, if we drill down a bit, so technically you've been a sales, sales manager mm -hmm. And then you've seen the opportunity for kind of productizing the offering, right? Yeah. Was this like the, the pitch that you made to the CEO? Productization, uh, basically, it was also, uh, it wasn't to the CEO. So the original founder wasn't an operative um, employee right. of the company. So it was more about we'd been working uh, as a project, as a tiny project team, basically. Mm. And if we want to change that and actually have uh, potential for more growth, instead of, because growth in a project business is purely based on the amount of he your headcount mm. at the end of the day. So, you know, you can deliver more if you have more people delivering. And theoretically, obviously, if you sell a project, you could hire more people, but that's difficult too. 
So how could you do that without increasing headcount mm. for every 100K or 50K you want to make? Um, so that was the pitch, like, let's do that. And of course, you know, there are circumstances. Uh, the original CEO didn't want to continue, etc. So of course, that might not have been possible if that mm. wasn't mm. the case. Um, but I definitely found that more interesting. Uh, it was definitely more motivating to actually build a platform. Uh, also, just more int- more fun. Uh, in a way, and we got we got quite lucky uh, in a way. Um, about nine months down the road, uh, since making the decision of building uh, a more productized platform, uh, we managed uh, to sign three really significant co- uh, clients. They're all three of them are still clients, and th- we're talking 2017 to now. They're still clients, uh, and very important ones for us. Um, but we managed to get them on board and that really helped us then hire a couple more people, develop it even faster, uh, also get some people in sales. And that's how we grew from three clients to the 80 logos we have now. Yeah, because also it is interesting to have a look like, okay, now now you're kind of CEO and at a product product company. Mm-hmm. But then also like it's it's interesting that it was not always like that. Yeah. That you, it's the journey of kind of reshaping and kind of recreating whatever you've been doing there. Yeah. And then also you mentioned that the, the previous CEO, he didn't want to continue. And then mm-hmm. so, so it's a substitution. So then it is your availability, your vision for the future, and then also the circumstances of, of okay, course. the CEO doesn't want to continue, but then there's an opportunity. Mm. So here it goes. Um, do you think this is a typical story or not really? Um, I don't think it's a typical story, at least based on the CEOs I've met. I feel like most CEOs in the sauce slash startup mm. scene you meet, they are what you described in the beginning. They are the original founder. They're the one, ones with the vision who built the team regardless of how ownership then structures out later on. But no, I don't think it's typical in that sense. Also, most startups do go with funding first. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's very rare to encounter um, a lot of startups where sales comes first. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that was in the DNA of the company anyway. I mean, the company was started around a big client. They had sold the idea to that client before the company even existed. Then they founded the company with that agreement in mind. So it kind of there wasn't really even thought of starting with investment first. Mm. It it had to be done uh, this way. And thankfully, we still had revenue coming in from those original customized projects. So one of the reasons why this is going in many directions, but one of the reasons why it took um, nine months to a year to get something done was because we were still managing the stuff we had yeah. built before. So we were still making bespoke stuff while we were also making the platform. Uh, so it was a big break to get those clients onto the platform Mm -hmm. instead but uh yeah i don't think it's i don't think it's very common i haven't met a lot of people there and i mean you can see that in the in the startup scene overall uh i've been asked to uh coach or spar with founders of like recent new companies and the angle at which uh, for which i've been asked to come there is usually to talk about how to sell Mm -hmm. uh as a founder and like how do you get your first clients and it's interesting to see that Roughly 50% of the um, founders aren't really interested in hearing that story because they're so focused on the pitching aspect. How do I get investors? How do I get everything else that they don't really think about actually the revenue model? Fair enough. A lot of founders are building products that are built uh, around, you know, consumer based uh, subscription models and okay, B2B sales experience isn't relevant or that relevant for those, those founders then, but there's a lot of but again so like you know sales sales the way i see it sales is not only the way to build up revenue for a company no. but then also this is the conversation with your customer this is from where you collect the feedback and also like typically you have a chance to get you know the, the best most critical feedback because mm-hmm. you're also discussing like the money and pricing that's aspects balance. that's a balance uh it that's a really tough balance and even for us it's been a lot of trial and error so you know um as an example, in that first year, I probably met 100, 150 different companies, mm. uh, marketing teams, sales teams, etc. cetera. Um, so you get these ideas like, hey, if you had this, we would be interested. Or if you had that, we would be interested. And then it's really tough to decide that if we make that, would they then actually buy? Mm. And then, you know, obviously we've been burned many times where we then did mm. what they said we need. To then eventually find out that no, oh, absolutely. That Sometimes make, they don't know exactly, they, and it, if it's a new thing, if yeah. it's a new concept that doesn't exist really, at least to their knowledge, 
then the ideas they come up with can be very, very, very industry specific. They could even be just their company specific, mm. like a, something that an insurance company needs might just be for them. Maybe even another insurance company doesn't even need that. Yeah. So it's tough to see, understand that when you're, when you're building the platform that what should I prioritize? Yeah. Here? But interesting. So if we fast forward this story, so it was like a Lowry back then and Lowry now, what would you, you know, maybe recommend to yourself on kind of this journey? Hmm. It's a good question. Maybe. And we are thinking maybe more of the career ladder, for example. So now you're a CEO. Mm. So then if you would give, you know, a few tips mm. to yourself back then to become a CEO. Hmm. Uh, well, several things. Uh, one, probably because we just talked about it, but one is believe in your own vision a bit more. Mm -hmm. I feel like we believed in it, but we also listened to clients. I, I, this sounds really bad if I say this, but I feel like we listened to clients just a bit too much. So we took detours in the wrong direction, sometimes yeah. a bit too often. So I feel like we should have believed in the vision a little bit more. We could have, say, trimmed off a year or two so we could be where we are now a bit earlier, maybe. Who knows? Uh, there are some uh, macroeconomic things also <laughs> that have gone <laughs> during the same time. Um, but on a personal level, um, hmm. I think there was a moment where I thought I could step away from sales a little bit more than I should have. And so this is, all, this is already many years ago, but I thought that we're at a point where I could hire salespeople to handle my part uh, better. But I didn't realize that that wasn't the moment to stop being founder led in sales. Hmm. Uh, so we weren't ready with our value prop. We hadn't really honed our um, ICP ideal customer profile that well. But then when I hired people, they did struggle quite a bit because they didn't have all that background baggage and information and knowledge of, you know, what we did wrong, what we did right. And a lot of our sales pitches still were related to, do you believe in my idea or our idea? And they weren't that much about mm. the platform itself. Now we're in a place where the platform does sell itself to a degree, a good degree, which is quite nice. But at, at some points we were not there. So you did have to sell the idea more than actually right. the demo, uh, so to speak. So I think, I think that's one thing where I, we also could have saved some time and money where, you know, I should have stuck in sales longer. Mm. Uh, and, you know, obviously mentioning that I still do sales a lot, that, we're still on that track a little bit where I do participate quite a bit in it. Myself. What's your plan? Are you planning to kind of move yourself out from the sales or how you, how you feel about that? I don't think so. Um, one reason is that um, in the Finnish market, um, which isn't obviously huge and the potential isn't massive, but there's no point in us hiring more resources to handle the Finnish market. Not mm. really. We have two of us who can in, in new business sales who are Finns. So I don't want to hire anybody for that, really. So I can handle Finnish cases just fine. Mm. Um, so not really, not really get out of that, but obviously minimize that a little bit. I can't be using 80% of my time on sales. Not that I do now either, but, but still. Um, longer term, um, international sales definitely needs to be uh, the responsibility of others. Um, I do have a nice little language advantage compared to a lot of people, at least when it comes to English, but that doesn't mean that Language skills aren't the only reason why right. uh, someone should be doing international sales, for example. So I, yeah, I do need to um, step away a little bit so I can focus a bit more on strategy and, and things like that. And the bigger we get, the more things require your attention. Yeah, absolutely. So some some weeks even now are much more product orientated. Some are strategy orientated. And we also before so. before we hit record, you mentioned some. Now you get way more inbound sales. Mm -hmm. So is it um, what do you see? Is it because your brand now working on you, or like, what's the reason of those inbound sales coming in? It's uh, uh, I'm not a marketing guru, but. Um, <laughs> One is definitely personal brand a little bit, um, have made some efforts on LinkedIn and that has helped, that has directly resulted uh, in inbound leads. The other is just word of mouth. Mm. Um, you know, the longer you're around, the more companies you've worked with, you know, people change jobs, they'll recommend it internally or they'll talk to friends. Right. Uh, but that's still very market specific. So obviously most of that happens in Finland. Uh, the only way that happens abroad is if they heard about it from one of our foreign customers mm. or even a Finnish customer. 
Um, but um, yeah, it's much more. It's much more word of mouth. But it's also such. I think like the way I hear the answer is it's such a kind of compound effect mm -hmm. of like okay, you've been doing it for years now, mm -hmm. and then you mentioned your customers that been with you since like since really beginning, yeah. right? So it means that they are happy, mm -hmm. and then it means that you are keeping them happy. You're probably developing the product somehow. You're taking good you know account management with them, right? And then even though through the industry the changes are happening, mm -hmm. they're still like overall bus is kind of happy with your product so then this brings your kind of new customers pretty much pretty yeah. much and i mean the easiest inbound lead is always uh, our main contact at company mm. x has now switched to company y and they call me on day yeah. two. uh you know that's that's the easiest inbound lead but but yes um and funny you should mention the overall changes in the market mm. uh and those things it's funny how fast from a startup or from i don't want to call us a startup anymore because we're not but uh <sighs> When you're in the startup scene, you feel like the market moves so mm -hmm. fast. There's new stuff coming every few months. And wow, it, this sounds so cool. You'd see the website of some new platform or whatever. Um, when your segment is B2B, and for us, we're talking mostly publicly listed companies, they move slow. Mm -hmm. So things that came out five years ago are still very new. And things that even might have come out 10 years ago might not have been implemented. So from our perspective, our main competitor is SharePoint. It's not even Dropbox. Mm. It's not Google Drive. It's SharePoint uh, for sharing content internally. So SharePoint's been around for what? 30 years probably? I don't know. Like this is one of the first thing in the internet. I mean, yeah, it's... Uh, exactly. I, I mean, it's basically I, you know, a network drive. I kind of never used it because I'm like, I'm too young for that. Well, you go to a corporation and you'll use it. I mean, yeah, they will, they will force me. Yeah, yeah exactly. But um, that, that's my point. So even if we feel like, wow, we're, yeah. still like, we're still riding on a feature that we made eight years ago, that's still, that might be brand spanking new mm, for someone mm. or really cool for someone. And you can forget that as well. But it's the cold, whole crazy thing. So I have this opinion that, you know, the bigger and cooler industries actually uh, are like so innovative and so forward looking. So for example, like avi aviation, right? So there are planes are flying. I was like, yeah, probably they're super safe and they're, they're all over and they're innovative and they're bringing new things. That's what I thought. The reality is a bit reverse it because is, yeah. it, is, it is a huge industry and there are so many planes. There is so hard regulations mm -hmm. because of the safety and all the reasoning. So then, good reason, yeah. so the reality is that if you want to change even like a small little thing, in the, I don't know, the construction of the chair mm. or like, you know, maybe even check-in process. Yeah. So it would require such a cascading effect mm. on all the planes, all the aviation the airports. airports and and like, yeah, so then it perceives as the, you know, cool, innovative industry, but it's actually not. It's like yeah, it was probably cool and innovative in the 50s or 60s. Yeah. 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 So from, from nothing is flying, then, you know, the, yeah, the exactly. things are really flying. Exactly. And I have nerded out on that yeah. specific topic quite a bit. So it's quite interesting how, just as a side note, how, how random mm. and how unprofessional things have mm. been in the 50s and 60s compared to now and how mm. safe it is now. But that is all down to regulation and that. But yeah, I mean, even obviously sales doesn't need that kind of mm. regulation. Um, Maybe in some industries. I'm super sidetracking, but then also aviation. I recently heard the story that there was the, um, um, how you call it? Like somebody was giving money, mm -hmm. like back then, like around 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. So for people to fly between, there was an award mm -hmm. given for people to fly from US to Europe right. when it was not the thing kind of yeah. yet. And then they were like, you know, 10 people who wanted to fly so then they flew and then only five arrived so five died but yeah, and, yeah, yeah. so just this award so somebody putting like you know fifty fifty thousand yeah. dollars for this thing just actually kick-started the whole aviation industry and people are like oh yeah it is possible let's build it up so yeah, it, yeah. it was somebody needed to put money for something risky and kind of stupid that half of people died <laughs> but then this kick-started the whole whole movement of the aviation yeah yeah yeah, that's true. That's true. That's a long time ago. It's probably 20s, 30s. <laughs> uh, but getting a bit back to the, um, so your company, and then let's speak about the bootstrapping. Mm -hmm. uh, so bootstrapping, the way I see it is when you're, first of all, kind of sales driven. So you kind of, you need to sell your product or services in order to develop. And then also you're not taking on board uh, external investments. Mm -hmm. And and I think the way I see it, there are maybe 
to believe mm-hmm. in in the in the world, overall startup or kind of business business world that like okay people believe in the bootstrapping so I, I do everything myself mm-hmm. or I take a loan or I you know my friends invest in me kind of small things or yeah. my friends are buying my products in order to kind of support my business or you go you pitch you find investors you give the share and then you pray for the you know VC money to boost you up yeah so then you've been bootstrapped for ever forever <laughs> yeah <laughs> have you ever thought of uh, investments and have you tried? Of course. Um, so one of the reasons why we are bootstrapped is because uh, because of the story I told you. Mm. Uh, our founder uh, model is a bit different. So if if I had founded this myself, maybe the and you know let's pretend I would have had hundred percent of the shares, for example. Then yes, probably at some point already there would have been an investment round. But right now we're at a point where operative ownership, so our employees own the majority of the company but uh, not the whole company. And that for a lot of uh, venture capital is uh, risky Mm -hmm. because they obviously would prefer you to own everything if you haven't received funding before. So basically we're in a, we're in a state from an ownership perspective where it looks like we've already had several rounds of investment, uh, at least one round of investment. So basically one of the reasons we're bootstrapping even still today uh, is because we want to grow to a certain point where the valuations will match uh, if we want to take funding at that point. But uh, to be fair, uh, looking at how the market has gone for a lot of software companies over the last few years, uh, it's been interesting to watch how many uh, sauce companies have had to reduce staff just to get some modicum of profitability going. And that has been very difficult and it's very against company culture uh, and so on because everything has been funded uh, by venture, venture capital. Um, whereas for us, it's always been profitability. So while I don't have the experience of, or we don't have the experience of, you know, growing, uh, with external funding, we already know how to handle a cash flow positive, uh, profitable business and, you know, grow it. Um, but yeah, we have definitely thought about it. Uh, we have definitely had conversations about it. There are, uh, ways to do it if we wanted to do it, but right now things are going very well, just bootstrapped hey. and I don't want to break that. Uh, unnecessarily either Let's right that way so because of like you mentioned the market changed so now in order to receive funding you need yeah. to show the like cash cash flow positive yeah, or exactly. like you know a certain or just pure EBITDA yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, so then it actually means that you are borderline on the choice of like if you want to be you know get the investment or not Mm-hmm. So it is probably the better place to be. So some some people are chasing funding because this is the only reason they can you That's know the only they stay alive. Yeah. yeah, they can they can only stay alive with the external funding and then kind of mm-hmm. scale and kind of proceeding to development. And then for you, you can choose like okay, I maybe I want or maybe I don't want. Yeah. But then also what I kind of see the bootstrap is probably harder. Definitely in some ways in some yeah. ways. But I mean at the end of the day, we're not responsible to others. Uh, so we can make our own decisions. We don't have to make them based on the vision of the fund who invested in us, for example. You know, if, if a fund comes in, they will have a time limit that they want to stick around. They will have a certain goal level they want you to get to. And maybe you don't get there. Maybe you don't get to the second round, mm-hmm. you know, series, series A or Series B or whatever. So we don't have that. So if we notice that, hey, um, let's say, as an example, if sales slowed down for a while, well, maybe we just hold off on some investment, mm. like, you know, hirings, for example, or something. But it's not, a, it's not, I'm not responsible to someone else about that decision. So I can still make that call or we can make that call uh, as partners together. Um, and I feel like I just like that control mm. uh, as well. But there's definite benefits to obviously growing with funding. But there's uh, back and forth here. But, you know, there's good examples in Finland of really fast growing bootstrapped companies I think vinyl being one of the more interesting ones. Mm-hmm. They've grown really fast. And if I remember things correctly, they're still bootstrapped. So they're bootstrapped. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So they're a good example of that. Because also overall in the market, if you have a look on the, you know, the new, like a startup scene and new companies that are like hardly anyone is bootstrapped. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much yeah. true. What do you think is the key for bootstrapped? You have to have something you can sell immediately or very soon. <laughs> But I mean, like you can you can <laughs> yeah, earn it and sell it. Like so, but is it more of the um, sales or product? Of course, it's both. Um, but I think uh, if you, assuming we're talking about software or so on, uh, it needs to be something that 
can fund you fairly soon. Uh, you need to have a product that has enough, a high enough price point that, or you can sell at enough mm. volume um, that you can fund yourself fairly quickly. Um, but at the end of the day, it comes down to having sales skills. And I personally believe you need to have the skill to sell slideware. It's not ready yet, but it look it will look yeah, like yeah. this. Uh, and that can be very difficult for a lot of founders. Uh, for some reason, they can be very easy to talk that to talk about that to investors, but then to get people to actually pay for that service to get a benefit, especially if it's not ready. That's well, why, why do you think it's not convertible? Because it is, you know, we're thinking of and we're speaking about vision, mm. vision sales. So you, if you're a founder, you need to sell your vision to your team mm. because if you're in early stage, they're like underpaid 100%. Mm. Then you need to sell the same vision or like a bit different vision mm. to investors to get the funding. And then the similar type but converted vision you would sell to clients. clients. Theoretically convertible. But um, I mean... We've had the advantage that we've had nice logos from day one. Mm. So, you know, if you have, like our, our first client was Vartzila. Mm -hmm. So if you have Vartzila there, it helps. Yeah, like it Even if it's still promise wear for yeah. the next one. Yeah. It helps that you have that one. If that's some company you've never yeah. heard of or a combination of logos that you've yeah. never heard of, it's very different to, hey, these guys. So um, that's a bit of a cheat code that we've had. Mm. Uh, so I'm not going to lie and say that that hasn't made things easier. Um but it is convertible and it is about being able to find people to believe in that vision. Mm. Have you seen people doing something similar to what like you guys are doing? Not in terms of the product, but in the structural approach of the business? I'm sure I have. I haven't paid that close attention yeah. to every single company on the market, but I feel like most companies who are able to bootstrap aren't really offering um, software products they're mo mostly offering you know services yeah. you know like the easiest example would be somebody offering lead generation mm. uh, you know you can start a lead generation business bootstrap because you know at the first you know at first it's just the founders doing the lead mm. generation uh, for someone um, and then you can maybe expand based on the amount of clients you get but uh, doing that with software and having to build the product at the same time unless you have a big group of friends who like developers who you know who are willing to work for bare minimum for or nothing pockets. yeah uh it's pretty tough yeah it's pretty tough yeah. so so like for us you know it obviously it was a big thing to be able to have a client who was paying for a lot of development there and also again like i think i already highlighted in our discussion that like uh having a customer that be that is sticking with you like over years mm -hmm. and in your case is like what 15 18 years we we're speaking about your longer customers um no I'd, since 2017 so the longest customers we've have, uh, had uh, started out in 2017 like our original clients aren't there anymore because they were there for the custom well, yeah they, they had like the project and then yeah. for such a long time and you still keep them with you and you're keeping them happy so i think this is also the key for most of the businesses and not only for software but then same for the service if if it's a recurring service that you need mm -hmm. to again so keeping your customer like basically forever mm -hmm. if they need this service i think this is also the key for like kind of steady steady growth absolutely or unless you're able to replace them at a mm -hmm. high rate mm -hmm. but yeah but then also what i feel like replacing is always more costly and harder more costly than so yeah it's much more difficult than growing something yeah, yeah 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 so i mean for us i mean we're in a business uh where the sales process can take a lot of time um, I mean, our average sales case lasts somewhere between four months and six months mm. in length uh, when, when we win. Um, so that means that we can't constantly replace, if we'd lost customers, we can't replace them very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, but for us, it's obviously just keeping the, the churn really low. So, uh, you know, it depends really on what you're doing. Some businesses are really, some, some platforms are really easy to sell. You know, the value prop is easy to understand quickly and it's easy to implement, but then might also be really easy to get rid of. Mm -hmm. uh, while then if you have a, because uh, our platform changes, um, companies have to commit to changing the way they work. So if they commit to that, it's not just the platform that they're committing to. They've actually changed the way they support their sales team. It's, it's, it, they've made a lot of effort. They're not going to get rid of it that quickly either if they've changed the whole process. Yeah, they're stuck. They're a bit more stuck. Yeah. Uh, of course, they can change the platform, but they might be stuck with the way of working. Uh, so then, you know, compare that to some platform that you can just, you know, log in and it'll work immediately. Well, you can also just not log in on some day and stop using it. Uh, I don't know what's a good example, but any, you know, like a data. data but like, platform. yeah. So with, with your product, like, you know, the companies are a bit more kind of connected. 
In a so way. They, they cannot give it up like that easy. So yeah. they, would, they would need to jump on something new and kind of on board to some new, new ways of working, new processes. Yeah, cool. Uh, moving on, something else that I'm interested in. What next for you? What are you looking for? What's your... Well, we're, um, uh, nothing, nothing, nothing special, <laughs> nothing special that much. Uh, I mean, growing sales frame is right now the, uh, the main vision. Um, but I don't know. Um, probably going to stick around in software uh, for a long time. But um, right now it's sales enablement, so I haven't given that much thought to uh, outside of it. Can you tell us what is the, this Mr. Sales Enablement thing? <laughs> for, for where did you, did you name yourself? Like? No, I don't. Uh, <laughs> I did in a way. Obviously, I'm the one who typed it in, in, in my LinkedIn title, but um, no, I, it came up from, uh, I can't remember who it was. Some client basically was yeah. making fun of me okay. jokingly and, uh, and just said, ah, yes, it's Mr. Sales Enablement again. I was like, hey, that's a good idea. <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm just giving credit to you because I think I, I'm, I really like correct brandings mm. and i think this mr sales and emblem this is like the part of your kind of professional branding yeah. and it is kind of there and then you use it you utilize it this is how you know people remember you better mm. this is how i remembered you i was like ah okay so we met in linkedin and after some time i was like ah yeah loudy mr sales <laughs> It is great, and you build this story, and you kind of communicate it through to people. So yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's really well done. I mean, sales enablement, for example, it's a topic where if you search LinkedIn right now in Finland, for example, there's probably less than 100 people with a sales enablement title. Mm. So uh, it's easy. It's mm. an easy area to right. be, you know, like try to brand yourself. And and to be honest, I mean, there's not that many people who have done over 10 mm. years of sales enablement anyway. So uh, it's, uh, I feel like it's sim- it's quite merited that I could say that. Of course, there are people who I'm sure, you know, like I haven't looked at it from, I haven't been an employee of a big company doing sales enablement. I've been providing a platform for them, but I haven't been there solving every challenge they've had internally. Mm. So those people have a perspective that I probably lack. But I, um, on the other hand, I've met thousands of companies and talked about sales enablement, so many industries that there's so many, you know, learning right. teachings that yeah. I can maybe spread to the world yeah i think i think this is great and also i know that you do a bit of like coaching and kind of you know sharing your knowledge mm. so please do more <laughs> <laughs> uh we are walking towards wrapping up um if you could emphasize one thing as an advice to anyone who is on the journey to 700 uh a r r in 700,000 700, euro annual recurring revenue. So what would be one advice? One advice you would give to the founder or a CEO, and then they're, they're not there yet, but they'd like to get to the 700,000. Um, I can't remember who it was on LinkedIn who recently posted this, but I 100% will sign on the dotted line on this statement. So anything under a million, focus on sales, and that's it. Like at the end of the day, strategy doesn't count that much. Um, you don't have a big enough company uh, where any larger strategy will matter more. Uh, yes, product will matter, but focus on sales. Get it to at least one million, uh, and then you can start thinking about bigger, larger uh, strategies from there. But um, until that point, it's all about discovery, like what works, what doesn't, and so on. So I don't think you can even do anything except founder-led sales until that point. Right. Unless it happens within six months. But if it takes you longer, then just focus on sales. Get clients. In. Focus focus on sales. You'll get feedback. You'll yeah. improve what you're doing based on that. And every time you lose a client or you win a client, you learn something. And Cool. Everybody, please go check out Lauri in LinkedIn. The links are, as always, in comments and like and subscribe. Thank you so much, Lauri, for being with us. You're welcome. Cool. Fine.